headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, this is the Entree Leadership Podcast, where I take calls from leaders like you about what it takes to win at any stage of business and leadership. I'm Dave Ramsey, your host, with over 30 years of experience in the trenches. Yes, I lead a business every day. I make decisions just like you do every day. I make mistakes just like you do every day. Maybe different ones than you make, but hey, we're here to talk about it together, and I want to help you win. If you're looking for someone that's doing a think tank and has a bunch of theory, you're in the wrong place. I'm an actual dude that runs a business. So uh, when I tell you something that we do, it's something we probably did today. So um, it's actual practical hands-on stuff. If you want to be a caller on this podcast, we'd love to have you. Call and leave a voicemail at 844-944-1070. 844-944-1070. Or fill out the form at entreleadership.com slash ask entreleadership.com slash ask and our team will get back with you and set you up to be a caller here on this show it's entree leadership summit week that's right boys and girls if you don't have your ticket you won't be here it has been a sellout for quite a while good news is there is a live stream later in the week that we can tune you into i'll tell you a little bit more about that later in the show but this is a big week for us if you're in town for uh for the entree leadership summit welcome to nashville we're glad you're here And uh, we got quite a lineup this week with Jordan Peterson and uh, Willie Robertson. Man, it's going to be absolutely incredible. Malcolm Gladwell, Dr. John Deloney, Ken Coleman, me, uh, Brian Buffini, many others. It's going to—it's quite a lineup. So uh, you're going to want to know more about that. And if you're again, if you're in town for this, welcome. I'll be seeing you in person this week. uh, A whole bunch. Going to be hanging out with you over at the Opryland Hotel Resort area. Quite a complex and. uh, you're going you're gonna to enjoy being with us. We're really, really glad you're here. Justin starts off in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Hi, Justin. Welcome to the Entree Leadership Podcast. Hi, Dave. I appreciate you taking my call today. Sure. What's up? Yeah, I had a quick question about delegation. So I've got a small organization of about seven employees, and one of my leaders really seems to be struggling with the idea of delegation or letting certain things go as, as we continue to grow. And I'm personally the kind of guy that can't wait to delegate things, um, probably because I'm a little bit lazy or because um, just don't like certain tasks. So I'm really starting to struggle with how to communicate the value and the importance of delegation to him, um, not only to help him grow, but to help us grow, you know, as an organization as well. So have you talked to him about why he doesn't delegate? Uh, Yeah. So every time we have a conversation about it. It just turns into a big conversation of us trying to convince him that this is what needs to happen. Um, you know, that I he, mean, why he has, doesn't he, why does he say he doesn't want to delegate? Because nobody can do it as good as he can, or it, you know, customer service is number one. And he seems to think that he's the best at that. And, you know, we can't teach others to do it as proficiently or as good as he can okay. essentially. Okay. All right. Well, th- there's, Two things going on. Number one, he could be right. The people that are his subordinates might not be good at it, in which case he's wise to not want to delegate because he's Mm -hmm. trying to protect you from yourself. Uh, If he's not right, then he's being a control freak. So, So what I would tell him is it is wise to not delegate until you can trust someone's competence and integrity. Now, you're not questioning the, under, the, the person, the subordinate's integrity. You're questioning their competence as this is you talking to your guy, right? And, and so tell me what it would take to get them to a level of competence to where you could turn loose of some of this so that we can get more scale. Mm-hmm. Because you understand that you're a bottleneck if we can't get scale. So we have to duplicate these efforts to more than one person. Otherwise, you're a logistical bottleneck. I mean, that's kind of common sense, right? So I'm talk- this is me talking to your guy if I'm you, right? And so I'm trying to get agreement. I'm trying to get understanding here rather than going, you have to learn to delegate. No, you really don't have to learn to delegate until you have people that have their crap together enough that you delegate to them. Because if you give customer service to a doofus, you're going to screw up your company. Right? Sure. So, you know, I often tell people until the until the – person that, that you're going to delegate to has been trained until they are showing, have shown a pattern of competency to take your hand off the wheel and let them drive. You're asking to wreck the car. 
Mm-hmm. You know, you don't toss them the keys and go, well, I once was, I was customer service rep at this other place and great, go, go take care of that. I don't want to do it. That's not delegation. That's stupidity. Mm-hmm. So I've done that. I've done it. Like you, I was laughing with you because you said, I don't like doing some stuff and I'm lazy. I think we all have that. That's one of the ways I delegated because it's crap. I didn't want to do. That's also, you don't, you know, that that's okay to choose an item. I don't want to do this. I hate accounting. For instance, I like reading the numbers, but doing accounting, just shoot me and get it over with. I don't want to do it. Okay. So, uh, but, but I, so I want to delegate the doing of the accounting because I hate it, just like you said. But that, but I can't delegate it to somebody unless I can prove that they actually can freaking do accounting. Because that would be like they they'd tear the place. They'd be like termites, tear the place down from the inside, right? Right. So anyway, do you think this guy has a point? And and we've said several times talking to him, we appreciate his reluctance because we're the kind of people who want to go and don't stop. And he kind of puts us in check a little bit and says, all right, let's think about this a little deeper. It's just, you know, certain office administrative tasks that an operator really should not be doing. It's like, well, I don't want to give all that up. Well, it's like, well, we need to, because you need to be freed up to do what you're truly most valuable at, not punching numbers in on a spreadsheet or fielding Facebook messages, you know? So it's, it's that kind of stuff that we're trying to you know, work him into, yeah. all right, let's find somebody else to come in, take this off your plate so that you can truly do what you're, you're best at, which is leading our how, team how old is and he? customer facing. Uh, he's 25, 26, I believe. Okay. And, um, I'm going to guess on the DISC that this guy is a C he's a detail guy. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And detail guys that are high C's are slow to make decisions, right? And this is a young C, so it's possibly emotionally immature C, and so super slow to make decisions because he's scared. If he screws this up, it's going to be on him. Mm-hmm. And so here, here's what I'm going to do with a 25-year-old C. I'm going to take the pressure off of him if I'm you. I'm going to say, listen, here's what we're going to do. I want you to take every I want you to take 10% of the Facebook messages. We're going to hand 90% of them to someone else. And I want you to check the 90%'s responses. And don't say anything to the person that did the response. If you find an error, bring it to me. And if there's a mistake, it's going to be my fault, not yours. Because he's afraid he's going to be held for mistakes. Sure. Because C's are very, very... Um, task oriented and uh they get their esteem from doing a task properly Mm -hmm. where you're probably more of a d or an i i'm guessing after talking to you and i am too and so we're like crap if we do it wrong let's do it again screw it up drop that one it broke let's not let's not drop the next one you know we keep going and the c's like oh god we dropped one you know it's like you know what i'm saying yeah so that i i think you just it's a young guy Let's, let's give him some backstop where he's not, look, if it gets messed up, I'm going to take the fall, not you. And I want you to have you look over their shoulder and you can help me train them. And you can spot check by taking one out of 10 of the Facebook messages, administrative stuff, entering stuff on a spreadsheet, man, if you want to move, if you want to do that, then I'm going to have to get somebody to be your manager. Yeah. Because I, the people that do the entry work into spreadsheets are not managers. They're not leaders. They're, they're, that's, a, that's, a, that's an entry-level grunt work position that sits and enters into spreadsheets. And if you want to be that guy, that's fine. But just know you're, gonna, you're getting ready to get a new boss mm-hmm. who's going to delegate to you. So you get to decide, which of these do you want to do? Do you want to run this thing or do you want to actually do the entry? And... Um, because, I mean, my God, if you think you can't find anybody that can do data entry, that's, that's pretty basic stuff. But, but you know, it, it, honestly, there's nothing wrong with being 25 years old, but 25 years old enters into this discussion. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah, so I, I think this is an opportunity for you to mentor him, take some of the pressure off of him, let him have some involvement in the training, and let him know the results of his decisions are he's either going to have a new boss or he's going to figure out a way to be the boss. Mm-hmm. He's going to have a new leader or figure out a way to be the leader. It's not a boss. But, I mean, you're either going to lead this or you're getting ready to be led. 
because we're getting ready to scale this beyond what you can do. You can't do everything and be everything and us get scale. You're a logistical bottleneck. And a C, a C will understand a phrase like logistical bottleneck. Yeah, that's, so I'm, I'm appealing through his personality style, if you will. That's what I would do. And, um, and then if he can't do it, I'm just going to take it away from him. It's that simple. I'm just going to, I mean, I'm, in a, in a, I'm going to be as gentle as I can, but eventually you, you, now you're the incompetent one. And I'm trying to delegate to you, and you can't delegate, so I can't delegate to you because you're incompetent. So i got to get somebody else eventually. I've either got to train you or i got to find somebody else who can do it. That's what I'm saying. You're getting ready to get a new leader, Bubba. And uh, th this is the plan. So step up or step over or step out. These are your three options, really. So level up, man. Level up. And, you know, we just talk it through. I'm not going to tell you, you don't have to do it tomorrow. And I'll give you a path to level up. That's what I mean by a training path, a, a gradual release. You know, you're going to turn this loose now. You're going to turn 80% of this loose with some training to the new person. Uh, but we've got to scale this and we've got to cut you loose because you're too valuable to be doing data entry, dude. You have too many skills that are way more, worth way more to you and to this team and to our customers. And, and you just go... You just go there all the way. So very, very good stuff. Folks, if you want to know more about what we're talking about, we're talking about the DISC model. It's a basic personality style model. There's lots of personality style models out there, the Enneagram, uh, uh, Myers-Briggs. There's a whole bunch of them. That, a lot of them have a, a lot of val validity. This is a basic one. It has ver a lot of validity. I've been using this thing for 42 years, roughly, and it doesn't answer all your questions, but it gives you an understanding of who you're dealing with and then going, oh, that person is a high S. They don't like conflict. They want unity. They want everyone to be, they want consensus. And so we've got to, if we're going to approach a decision with that person, we've got to approach it differently. If we're going to sell that person, we are got to sell them differently. So we have every one of our team members, when they join, take the DISC. We print out the results in a bar graph, whether they're a high D, high S, high C, whatever they are, and we put it on their workstation. So when I walk up to them, I can look at that and go, oh, that's how this person processes information. Now I can have a different kind of conversation with this person that they can relate to, that I can connect to them. Or I could walk up and not care and still have the same conversation I was going to have anyway. Either one of those is okay, but at least I've got the information as a possibility. And the, the tests are really inexpensive. We sell them in bulk, and we sell them as individual one-offs in the RamseySolutions.com store, so you can check them out there as well. But the DISC model, one of these days we'll do just a teaching on it here. There is a teaching on it, by the way, in Entree Leadership Elite. And you can take that, you can join Entree Leadership Elite for free at entreeleadership.com for 30 days and check it out. And you'll be able to see what I'm talking about here. It's a, it's a good way, though, to learn how to talk to your folks, with your folks, guide your folks, lift your folks, and even sometimes reprimand your folks in the right tone with the right set of language and narrative. This is the Entree Leadership Podcast. Welcome to the Entree Leadership Podcast. We're glad you are with us, America. This is the podcast by small business people for small business people, answering your questions on how to level up and do the next thing. If you're a business leader and you haven't signed up for the Entree Leadership Summit live stream, it is this week, people. You're about to miss it. In room, of course, has been sold out for months. Uh, you can't come. Sorry for the FOMO. But the live stream starts Wednesday. This is not a conference you can afford to miss. Malcolm Gladwell, Dr. Jordan Peterson, Manit Shohan, Patrick Lincioni, Willie Robertson, so many more. Brian Buffini, me, uh, Dr. John Deloney, Ken Coleman. Just think, how much better would your business be this year if you had leadership insight from business and thought leaders like that, baby? Hey, probably more than you think. It's going to be worth every penny and every minute of time you spend doing it. Listen, you do not get better unless you have new information, new inspiration new and fresh vision. And it only comes from doing stuff like this. I've done stuff like this my entire career. I read like crazy and I watch and attend stuff like this like crazy. Any chance I get. But you only got until Friday to join us. It starts Wednesday. We're going through Friday, period. After that, your next opportunity to experience Summit will be a year away. And we'll be telling you about that real soon too. So, entreeleadership.com slash live stream and get your live stream ticket, and you can be part of the program. We'd love to have you, man. Hey, Abby's with us in Topeka, Kansas. Hey, Abby, what's up? Hi, Mr. Ramsey. I appreciate your time today. Certainly. I'm honored to have you. How can we help? So I have owned and operated a wedding and event venue for almost six years. 
Our annual revenue is around 650000 We have three full-time employees and 20 seasonal associates who help us throughout the wedding season. And I feel like we've almost reached our max revenue for this space and curious what the next steps are to continue leveling up our revenue. Okay. So you're booked out. You logistically yes. don't have any days left. Correct. Or not reasonable days. I mean, you have weird yes. days left, but they're not bookable really. Yep. Correct. Okay. I mean, like you're not, like what's a night you would never book? Like Thanksgiving night, right? That'd be weird. Oh, well, you actually yes. might be highly popular. I don't know, but. Yes, correct. Correct. And there are some days that we need for rehearsals and some days that are just booked out logistically to host the other events on the weekends. Uh, okay. So wait a minute, like you're doing host other events other than weddings? Yes. So during the week, we um, hold business events and other types of training events. So we rent it out during the week as well. Do they make um, as much then- as weddings? We have implemented an all-access package where we work with other vendors, um, and so they do get us a, a better, a, a good profit, not as much as a wedding, but we do book it out for that so day. So would you, for, would you rather sell a wedding that night than a business event? Can you? I, for Mondays through Wednesdays, it's harder. We do have some weddings, but we usually have a smaller crowd, so it would be more of a micro-wedding or wanting those types of days. And so a business and a micro wedding are very comparable. For okay. Reason. So you've already explored the idea of shifting your business mix a little, and it really doesn't make sense. It's going to be one of those. It's going to be micro or business fills in those weekday dates. Your weekend is your big number, and that's the wedding number. And particularly in, in, in wedding season, it's bizarre. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Do you have a uh, seasonal pricing? We do not. We have daily price or we, uh, different days. Why would things. June so, not be a whole lot more than the worst month? Do you see, what's, the, what's the worst month? Um, I would say February, January, and February are the worst months. In case really, February. Valentine's? That is engagement season. Yep. So oh, December engagement, through not February. wedding mm-hmm. season. Huh? Yep. Oh, okay. Yep. Oh, interesting. Okay, so then what I would do is go through and say what are what are the hardest months to book. And I would leave their pricing alone, and I would raise my premium months. Perfect. And get okay. my revenue Great. up. And so what I want to do is max out this thing before I start talking about, uh, and that's why I was poking around on the business mix as well. Do we change the business mix during the week? Sounds like you don't. But I think I think June should, and June and July should be a lot more than February. Yes, definitely. And September and October, the fall weddings are prime right now. Yeah. And do you, uh, is December a big month? It is. We do host weddings, but we charge a premium for um, larger business events, so larger holiday parties. Yeah. Okay. So you don't do like the uh, tax wedding. Like I get if I get married by the thirty first, I get a tax deduction, right? Correct. Correct. I I think I'd advertise that one in the last week, but anyway. (laughs) (laughs) I like it. I know nothing about your business, so don't listen to me. Okay, that's dumber than crud. All right. (laughs) <laughs> but it's just, I know people that do get married, the second marriages in particular, by the end of the year, because they want to make sure they get the tax. All right. Uh, yeah. First thing I would do is max out all, and it sounds like you've explored a lot of them, but I, I, I would look to where I can fine tune my pricing schedule. You probably have as much as, you said you did a million dollars top line? No, six hundred and fifty. I'd like to. That's my goal. My yeah, goal is to get to a million. I, I, I'll bet. I'll out. bet you got another one hundred and fifty to two hundred thousand top line you can add by messing with your seasonal pricing. That's my guess. Um, and um, we've got a couple of product lines we do that with that we have to that we have to shift around how we charge uh, because of their seasonal stuff. And so, hmm, that's one thing. And then your question was what again? Restate that after I poked around on this. Yes, just how to level up our revenue um, and kind of just when do you add another revenue stream, kind of what you're hitting at. Yeah, okay. The first thing I would do is let's, let's, let's do the tweaks we were talking about. Then once it's full again and June is 25% more in February or whatever the number is, okay, uh, that you find, you find that sweet spot and you go, okay, then I'm going to raise all my prices 10% and just see what happens. So there's a thing like in, in property management, there's a, a correlation to this, a metaphor for this. If you have an apartment complex that has 250 units and you're 100% full, your rent is too low. Sure. You should have healthy 
apartment complexes should have a 5% or 7% vacancy rate because they're leaving because you bumped them out. That makes sense. You kept it right on the edge. If the only way you can, because the only way you can keep it a hundred percent full is be too cheap. It's impossible otherwise. So you need to. You're not pushing the edge of the market value of the apartment complex if you're a hundred percent full. And that's what I'm looking for here. You're close to a hundred percent full. So the first thing we'll do is bump the, um, bump the uh, a seasonal. The second thing I do is I would bump across the board once I'm full again. Because you're obviously good at selling this, and it sounds like you are uh, stellar at executing the actual events. Like you guys are event yes. ninjas, right? <laughs> yes, yes, correct. Yep. I mean, you just knocked this out, team. right? And so, I mean, you, you're killing this. I mean, you guys, it's obvious you're, because we do events and I can smell it in the way you're doing this, the way you're talking about it. You, you know exactly how to execute this with excellence. You have very few complaints after the event is closed, except by somebody who's just an unreasonable person. <laughs> Correct. Yep. 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 I, I suspected that. So it's time to raise your prices. Yeah. First, let's I do it. it. First, let's do it seasonal, and then let's do a 10%. And if you still don't have any vacancy, raise it another 10. I want you to have trouble selling it out. Perfect. And then that, t- that tells you you've maxed the location out. Then you've got a model that, yeah, we start looking for another location then. We start going, okay. We've got this thing where it's ROIing. We've got to, we're milking as much of this cow as possible. Let's get a new cow. We gotta get another awesome. one. And then you're doing yep. that. So yeah, you're you're you you're really how long have you been doing this? Um so we've owned it for six years. So I've yep, about six how, years. How how much was the revenue the first two years? Oh, a hundred. Yeah, that's maybe? what I thought. Yeah. You you're 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 on a really steep growth curve here. You've learned to delegate, you've learned to grow. I mean, you, you went from treadmill operator to Pathfinder, and you're probably sitting at the tra- trailblazer stage, I think. Oh, man, you just made my day. Thank yeah. you. I think, I think that's where you are. You're, you're, you're really – you see the hockey stick in the revenue, but we also see it in your learning curve because that, that's, that's causing your revenue to happen. So you're, you're amazing, Abby. Well done. I'm so proud of you. Very cool. I'm honored to talk to you. Honored you're in our audience. You call me anytime. I'll help you anytime. I want to hear, hear more about your success and – and again, don't take my advice on um, whether to do a tax wedding or not. Don't that work. This is the Entree Leadership Podcast. This is the Entree Leadership Podcast. I'm your host, Dave Ramsey. I have a PhD in DUMB. If you've done stupid, well, I got you beat. I've done more of it than you have. That's why I'm more successful. A pile of the gleaming mountain of success is a pile of trash. You just happen to be standing on it instead of laying under it. I've been doing this for 30 years and freaking survived all of my stupidity and some of my team's stupidity. I've even survived some of my genius and some of their genius, and so will you and so have you. Welcome to the land of small business where real people get real work done. We know how to get up, leave the cave, kill something, and drag it home. No corporate asinine BS here. We're getting it done, baby. We're glad you're here. If you want to be on the show, leave us a message at 844-944-1070. We'll make you a caller. Uh, This comes in from Instagram, the Grams. How do you scale or grow a business without capital? Um, I did this one. I never put in, I've never put in any outside capital into this business. It started on a card table in my living room. And it's, it's called organic cash flow. You make money, make a profit on your business, and you buy some food and pay the light bill at your house, and you put the rest of it back into the business. And you buy some food, and you pay the light bill, and you put the rest of it back into the business. It is limiting, and here's what's interesting. If you don't have the money you won't be able to do some of your stupid ideas that would cause you to go broke. I have avoided some really large scale, stupid ideas simply because I didn't have the money. (laughs) Not because we knew they were stupid. We only knew they were stupid five years later when we looked back and went, Oh, I'm glad we passed on that. That would have killed us. Yeah. I'm glad. I'm glad God didn't give us the money to blow this thing up with because we couldn't afford the dynamite. Yeah. So so organic cash flow is how most privately held family businesses 
grow. The idea that bank loans or debt of any kind has caused small business in America to prosper is absolutely factually inaccurate. It's a lie. There's just not that many small businesses that borrow money. Number one, you can't get a loan. You're not bankable most of the time. And the number of small businesses that prosper because they bring in an angel investor is very small. Very few can attract an angel investor. Because no one believes in your idea like you do. And no one executes on your idea like you do. And venture capitalists, nobody does. It's just, it doesn't, you know, you got to get a business to a certain size before you attract those kinds of people, number one. And then number two, by the time you get it to that size, you don't need them. And if you go down to the bank and borrow $200,000 to start something, you're going to screw this up. If the bank's dumb enough to loan it to you because you have other assets, you're getting ready to burn some of your other assets to the ground. So the way you scale or grow a business without capital is you create capital called profit. And you start small, and you snowball. Every time the snowball rolls over, it gets a little bigger. When we we built, we just finished a Ramsey Event Center. We just had our first public event sold out there. It's a fifty million dollar building. When I started on a card table in my living room, I didn't have fifty million dollars to build a fifty million dollar building. If I needed to have an event, I rented one from someone else. I rented their fifty million dollar building for ten thousand dollars for that day. And we sold tickets, and we made $100,000, and we took that $100,000, and we hired some people, and we sold some more tickets, and we have never had our own event center in 30 years. We've used someone else's until now. So, you have to have an event center if you're in the event business. No, you don't. There's event centers everywhere. They're all over America. You have to have a printing press. No, you don't. There's printing companies. Just hire one of them and make them vendors. You know, you, you, can, you can rent all this stuff, or you can hire someone else that has all this stuff and let them do it for you. There's, you do not have to be in all these businesses, and capital intensive is just ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. So, no, grow small, reinvest your profits in things that make profit quickly. Um, we at Ramsey, until the last five years, have not done, have, have virtually done no investing into product lines unless they would return the capital plus a profit within 12 months. We don't do five-year programs. We just, because our mindset has always been, we need to make money by Friday because we got to make payroll. We've always been that way because we're cash basis. We don't borrow money and we reinvest the profits and we reinvest the profits. And if it's the profits aren't coming for five years, this is a problem, boys and girls. So uh, we're at a position now we have enough cash that we can actually do that and get away with it. But when you're in the early stages, you can't do that stuff. So not an option, not an option. Or it's called organic cash flow. That You make the money and you put the money you made back into the business. And, and every time you do that every year, it'll be a little more and a little more and a little more and a little more. And our revenues in 2023 will exceed $300 million. So a little more. It's a little more. It's a little more. But it wasn't that when I was on a car table in my living room. It wasn't three hundred dollars, man. I mean, uh, a week. I mean, it wasn't you know what? I mean, make through made more than three hundred dollars, but not much. And it, it felt like it felt like three hundred bucks. But um, because I mean, we're watching where we're buying copier paper for God's sakes. All right, we're gonna go to Canada and talk to Dawson. Hey, Dawson, welcome to the Entree Leadership Podcast. Hey, Dave, thanks so much for having me on. I started listening to the Ramsey show when I was 18. Five years later, uh, me and my now wife have uh, stayed out of debt completely, and that has been an insane uh, blessing for us. So thanks for all that you guys do. Well, thank you, brother. How can we help today? So I run a small uh, landscaping company that I started about two and a half years ago. Um, Last year, we did about $220,000 in revenue. On that 220, um, we netted about a hundred thousand dollars total, bottom line. Um, and out of that hundred throughout the year, I paid myself a sixty thousand dollars salary. So now we have, um, you know, we're two and a half years in. We have about forty thousand dollars in retained earnings. And I'm just curious about your thoughts on how I might balance two desires: one being taking that forty thousand and reinvesting it into the company, 
or uh, taking that 40000 and all future other year retain, retained earnings for that matter, or taking that 40000 um, and investing it into some of the larger ticket uh, personal financial goals that me and my wife have, such as uh, paying off our mortgage you know, over the next five years or something to that effect. You need retained earnings uh, a maximum of six months of business expenses. Okay. And if you get if you get That's, that uh, if you get anything more than that, take it home and do something with it. Um, and then before you get to that point, what we have done, and, and I've never gotten there by the way. I don't have six months of operating expenses and retained earnings now. I mean, that would be hundreds of millions of dollars, right? I don't have that. Uh, I've got mm-hmm. really nice retained earnings, tens of millions, but I don't have hundreds of millions of retained earnings sitting in the company, and not with a three hundred mm-hmm. million dollar company. So um, that that's I've never gotten there. What we do though is we say before I get paid, before the operating board, which also gets paid off the same line I do, as if they were partners, although they are not technically. Um, we we before that line item, we take out a percentage of net profits each month and add the retained earnings. So you pick a percentage that you want to put to grow retained earnings steadily, say 10%, 20%, 15%, something like that, right, of your profits. And so it sounds like you made $100,000 last year, so let's say you're making $8,300 a month. Let's say you did uh, 15%, so that's going to be like $1,500 a month. Okay? So we're going to mm-hmm. we're going to say fifteen percent of retained earnings is fifteen hundred bucks a month. We're going to grow this, and anything past that that's a profit, I'm taking it home in addition to my salary. So I pay my salary, I take out the percentage for retained earnings, and what's left over, I take it on home because you're growing retained earnings at a very good rate, a good clip. It's not shrinking. You're not going to run out of money at the company. You've got the money to grow with at the company. You've got the money to protect a downturn at the company. And then the rest of it, you're going home to build wealth with. And that's exactly what I have done for 30 years. That is, that's uh, very clear and, uh, and very helpful. And uh, yeah, thanks so much for that framework. I sincerely appreciate that. Sure, man. It's a simplistic system. It's fairly uh, primitive and it has worked beautifully. Uh, And so, and by the way, again, I've never with the percentage of our bottom line going to retain earnings every month, I have never achieved a full six months. If I ever did, I would stop any percentage going to it. I take the, all of it home, you know, because it's big enough. You don't need to be a wash with cash down there. That's a bunch of cash, by the way. That's a bunch of cash. This is the Entree Leadership Podcast. This is the Entree Leadership Podcast. I'm your host, Dave Ramsey. Thank you for being with us. Hey, we need your help out there. If you hate this show, listen to something else. If you love it, help us out. Leave a five-star review. One stars aren't helpful. Mother said if you're having anything nice, don't say anything at all. Subscribe and follow and share. So click the subscribe button. Click the follow button. Click the share button or share the link and tell somebody to start listening to this show. Uh, Our rankings on the show are way up. Because you guys have been doing that, thank you very much. You're our only advertising. And so if you don't do your job, (laughs) we're going to have to get new listeners. (laughs) Uh, So follow, subscribe, leave a review. We love you. We're glad you're here. Dan is in Philadelphia. Hey, Dan, welcome to the Entree Leadership Podcast. Hey, Dave. Thanks for taking my call. Sure. What's up? So I own a landscape design build company, and uh, we're entering our fourth year in business, and uh, we're really starting to achieve some good growth. Um, As I grow the business, I'm wondering what your advice is on purchasing new versus used vehicles and equipment. Uh, I know your rule for purchasing personal vehicles is to buy used until you're a millionaire and obviously always in cash. Um, So just wondering what your guidance is. Um, when it comes to business purchases of that type. Yeah. Um, the difference in new and used has to be service, meaning that you're going to get a lot more use without breakdown. Uh, and you have to be able to actually find some actual data points on that, not just in your head go, well, it's not going to break as much, because it probably is going to break as much. 
in your world. It probably you're probably not going to get substantially different service out of new versus you. I mean, versus I'm not saying when I say used, I don't mean worn out. I mean slightly used. I mean, and it, and so if you're saving fifty percent on the purchase and it's one year old or two year old, it's still got a lot of life in it, depending on what it is, right? Right. So yep. what I'm looking at here, the th- let me tell you what happens. It happens here too. It happens with these guys in the booth right here that I'm looking at, because these guys like to buy electronic crap. I've got so much electronic crap around me right at this moment that costs millions of dollars, and if I don't watch, they will spend tens of millions of dollars, just because they like to buy stuff. They like to. They're, they're boys and girls that like toys. And they just like to buy stuff, and they think I'm Santa Claus. They're all laughing at me right now. But, <laughs> okay, but the I, we all are that way, okay? If we're going to buy a, a, a piece of equipment, we have to be really careful that we're doing a pure business analysis on it, that there's no, uh, like, I'm bad because I have a new Bobcat versus a used Traco, you know, right? Yeah. And, and uh I was looking at Tracos the other day, and I, I mean, uh, uh, that's not what you call them. What's a bobcat? What are they called? Um, skid, skid steers. Skid, skid steers. Yep. Yeah, skid steers. Yep. I was looking at skid steers for my farm, and I'm looking at the new ones versus the used ones. And so I'm looking at it right now. I have absolutely no need for this except it's a toy, right? But I'm still looking at, you know, stinking thing's 95000 bucks, okay, for a new Caterpillar, right, uh, which is like a Bentley in that world. Or I can get a used half worn. I can get a completely destroyed one for twenty thousand bucks. That's useless because it won't start when I go to start it, and then I'll be mad at my toy. That won't work. So the same kind of stuff you're doing here, you got to look at that. Okay, what's the what kind of it, it's got to be dependable. Mm-hmm. And so um, the way we analyze stuff around here is, if it is such a small percentage of our overall budget that it doesn't matter, we just buy the best and we buy brand new. Okay, so for instance, uh, if we're buying uh, a, a, a a computer, one computer out of uh, 1,100 people that have computers, it's a small percentage of our overall budget. It won't matter one way or the other. But you're talking about a large purchase as a percentage of your world, I'm guessing, correct? Yes, that's right. Yeah, so in that situation, what we do is we say the, the proper business question is, what is the least I can spend and reasonably with reliability get the job done? Because everything else is an ego purchase. Mm-hmm. What's the least I can spend and reasonably get the job done with reliability? So if you're buying a, a skid steer or you're buying a mower uh, or, or you're buying a backhoe or whatever it is in your world, or there might be things you would purchase, right? then you're going to look at that and go, okay, with the use I'm going to get of this thing, how am I going to get an ROI on it? Uh, if we only use the thing twice a month, we probably ought to just rent one. Right. But if we're using it every day or three times a week, then maybe it starts to make sense, and we're probably going to get an ROI on this. But what's the least I can spend and get the job done reliably? And uh, And then you look at it and you go, okay, the least I can spend to get the job done reliably is 60000 bucks for a used one. But I can buy a new one for 65000 and I don't have to think about maintenance right now. I'm probably doing that one. Okay? But if I can buy the used one for 60000 and the new one's 90000 in your world, that 30 is a bunch. Yes. You're probably not getting an ROI on that 30. That's probably ego purchase. Am I, is that, am I, am I, is this, am I reading yeah. your mail or not? You are the um, so and specifically, I'm thinking about buying a new truck. So I'm wondering, is there pickup truck or uh, a truck a that pulls dumper, a trailer? Uh, the latter, a dump truck. Um, I'm a dump wondering truck. if there is a, a dollar amount you would even put on um, like brand image. So a nice new none truck that looks good. Okay. Zero. Mm-hmm. Zero. No one has ever hired a dump truck because they liked the way it looked. They just wanted crap hauled. Mm-hmm. Zero. That's completely bogus. None. Just wash it off, keep it clean. But no one went, oh, I'm so happy I bought, a, I, I got my dirt hauled by a $150,000 truck versus a $50,000 truck. I couldn't care less. I just wanted to stink of dirt hauled. Mm-hmm. I'm the customer. No, zero. Zero. 
We just moved, we just did a million and a half dollar uh, earth moving contract with a local earth moving firm on a uh, on a piece of commercial real estate that we're developing here. And I did not look at any of their trucks. Not one. All I wanted was the freaking dirt moved. On time, by the way. You know? And so, no, that that's that's ab- that's ego for sure. For sure. And construction guys do this with their trucks on the site all the time. They'll buy a $65,000, $80,000 pickup truck and pull it up on a construction site, and they're the brokest guy on the site. The richest guy on the construction site's driving one that's beat on every side, and he's laying bricks over there, and you think he's a worker and he owns the company. Right. That's the guy who's the richest. He's got a $1.2 million net worth, and the broke guy's got a $750 F-150 payment. But he's looking good. You know, it's just, it's, it, it's so ego based. It's so ego based. And so, yeah, no, I, I would buy the minimum truck that would haul the stuff. And here's the thing your primary business is not earth moving. Right. That's a secondary, a secondary piece of equipment. It's not a primary piece to get your job done, correct? Well, the truck would be used daily. For what? Uh, for, Getting to the job, executing the job, hauling material. A dump truck? Yeah, yep. Dump you... truck with a toolbox attached into it. Not a full-size CDL dump truck. Okay, I got a different like thing a in my head. All right. So, what, yeah, so, yeah. so it's like a flatbed that dumps? Exactly, yeah. Okay, so this is like a one- or two-ton truck? Four or six, but yeah. Yeah, okay. All right, but this is not a multi-axle diesel peter built looking okay all right a different thing in my head okay mm-hmm. yeah just mm-hmm. the same though just the same so the dump fun- function on it is not the main function the main function is the toolbox and and getting to the jobs transportation correct yeah yep. so again minimum truck that will get the job done uh and you compare a used with a new and say really okay let's just play that let's play it out what, what would the used one cost what do you think? Yeah, use use in my area going between forty and fifty. Okay, and a new one's what? Ninety plus. Okay, so tell me where you're getting your extra forty grand back if you buy the new yeah. one. I don't see it. No. You get a good used one and call it a day. Mm-hmm. It's function. It's utilitarian value. That's all it is for business. All you're trying to do is get the job done. We're not trying to make a statement with prestige. If you want to make a statement with prestige, get rich and buy a Ferrari, okay? Right. That's your prestige. But it ain't your freaking dump truck. You know, no, I'd save my forty grand and I'd buy two trucks. Right. Because I can get twice as much work done. That's your utilitarian function. That's the direction to go. Okay, I should have just gone straight to the real question. That was dumb on my part. I, I had to go around the barn twice, but we got to discuss a lot of fun things like my skid steer uh, lust that I have right now. So there you go. Um, <laughs> yeah, any of you that have one? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> if you want to donate it to uh, Dave's Bahama Fund, it's a nonprofit uh, skid steer organization. No, I'm just kidding. Absolutely, I'm kidding. I don't have a Bahamas fund. I have a Cabo fund. All right. Uh, The Entree Leadership Podcast, boys and girls, thank you for listening. Remember, better a wary warrior than a quivering critic. Leaders serve. Leaders are active, not passive. Leaders act on principle, not appearances. This world needs more high-quality leaders. So choose to lead. I'm Dave Ramsey, your host. Thanks for listening to the Entree Leadership Podcast.